So in case there's someone that is interested in watching this later, if they missed today. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and then push the present button. All right, so way back in one of the very first class periods, when we first started talking about water, and we started talking about uh, the Harriet Park Detention Pond, we, we talked about the idea that we could redesign the Harriet Park Detention Pond, Wayland Pond, um, other detention ponds, redesign them to not only serve their function better, the function being to filter uh, the storm water before it is delivered to our surface water, filtering mostly sediment, other pollutants, but mostly sediment and everything that's attached to the sediments. And then in addition to that, provide additional um, ecological services, uh, adding a degree of nature to a public space. Um, <clears throat> in the case of the new Verona High School detention ponds, incorporating a cross country course, incorporating that detention pond into an outdoor laboratory. And instead of just having a depression with mowed grass down to the edge of the water, by planting native plants and introducing native species, maybe we could actually produce um, something that resembled an ecosystem. And so then at the time uh, we talked about this, one of the things that I had presented to you was this idea of uh, data collection. And what data could we collect that might show that the efforts we are making in these detention ponds is actually producing a healthy ecosystem? And by extension, clean water. So how do we know that our efforts are working? And so when I asked you that question, we had lots of good answers. Some of you said, well, we could measure the chemistry of the water. And by measuring the chemistry, maybe we would be able to determine whether or not there are pollutants in there. Some of you said, well, collect the sediment and measure how much sediment's being collected at the point where the water enters the detention pond and how much sediment is leaving on the other end. Some of you said we could actually go out and collect garbage and that would be a way to do it. Some people said, well, what if we measure the clarity of the water? I saw that answer a few times. And the assumption is the clearer the water, the cleaner the water. And then some of you mentioned this idea that we could actually measure and count the wildlife that's living in the pond. And with the presence of say, a, a frog species indicates something about the health of that ecosystem. And that idea is the idea that I would like to, to work off of. So one day next week, I'd like to take a, take a day and, and travel to one of the detention ponds with a net. And on that day, I would like to sample the invertebrate aquatic life in the pond. And in particular, I would like to look for this little guy right here. <clears throat> this is a dragonfly nymph or dragonfly larva. And the reason that, <clears throat> excuse me, we look for that species. Let's talk about that for a moment. So this gets into this idea that uh, some species can tell us more about an ecosystem than others. And so <clears throat> rather than trying to do a sample and look for every single plant or every single animal insect that is out there, if we are able to collect certain insects or certain plants or certain char characteristics of the ecosystem and find certain things, those things can indicate something about the health of that ecosystem. And in this case, the dragonfly larva is one of those indicator species. So think back to that assignment we did with the Gulf of Mexico. With the Gulf of Mexico, we said right where the Mississippi River drains into the Gulf of Mexico, there's this large dead zone. And after doing a little case study on it, we discovered that that dead zone is caused by the lack of oxygen in the water. Fertilizers come down, 
the Mississippi River, they enter the Gulf of Mexico, and those fertilizers initiate and feed large algae blooms. Well, eventually the algae consumes all of the nutrients in the, in the Gulf of Mexico. That algae dies, and the bacteria then take over eating the algae. The bacteria, in the process of eating the algae, they need oxygen. They use the oxygen that's in the Gulf of Mexico, leaving the water essentially void of all oxygen, dissolved oxygen in the water. Without oxygen, it's difficult to sustain life. Fish, insects, things that live in the water require oxygen to survive. So the reason this dragonfly is an interesting species to us, number one, it is reliant on dissolved oxygen. So if you find a dragonfly larva, you know that that dragonfly is breathing oxygen that's dissolved in the water. So dissolved oxygen is an indicator of wetland quality. If you find a species that survives on dissolved oxygen, you know it's there. The other thing that's interesting about this species is it's the top of the food chain. Uh, for these aquatic insects. When you see one of these in person, they are ferocious looking little beasts. They're big, um, they're aggressive, and they consume other insects. So if we think of a food chain or a food pyramid, the dragonfly would be at or near the top of a food chain. So when you find the top of the food chain, the assumption is the rest of the food chain is present. You're not going to find a wolf pack in a place where the other parts of the food chain are not present. So you don't have to collect the whole food chain if you find the top of the food chain. And the last thing that's interesting about the dragonfly, this larva right here, nymph, this guy can live in the water for several years, three, four, sometimes five years before it emerges as an adult. So if you find a really mature dragonfly nymph, you know that that water has been good quality water, not just in that moment, but you know it's been good water for many, many years. So next week, if we, um, if we have time, and I think I can make time next week, I would like to go to one of the ponds and, and do a sample. Normally, I would take you all with me, but to this year, that's not really possible. Uh, so we'll do a sample and we'll see if we can find this. Now, before we go, I want to just contrast this with one thing, and that is a mosquito larva. So very commonly when we talk about wetlands, the first thing that um, students think about, or anybody for that matter, they think about mosquitoes. And this is a little video of mosquito larva. Now notice the behavior of this species, very different than what you're gonna see in a dragonfly. The mosquitoes, and I'll just pause here for a second. The long skinny ones are the larva, the short round ones are the pupa. So the mosquito starts as an egg, the egg hatches into these long skinny larva. Then eventually after feeding and growing in size, the larva pupate, they turn into this little thing here, and in this stage, they're transforming themselves into what we know as the adult mosquito that's going to bite you, the females. So what you notice in this picture is that the mosquitoes are going back and forth. They go to the top, and then they go back down in the water, and then they always come back up to surface. The mosquitoes are not consuming or breathing. They're not breathing oxygen that's dissolved in the water. They're breathing atmospheric oxygen. So mosquito larvae do not have the ability to breathe underwater. They have to come to the surface, grab a little bit of air, and then they go back down. So what that means is this species can occupy water, a body of water that is in high quality. This species can occupy literally any body of water, as long as that water is present for about two weeks. In this case, they're living in a jar, okay? So if we find uh, mosquitoes, that may or may not be an indicator of good quality water. And in some cases, it might actually be an indicator of very poor water, if that's the only thing we find. Last thing I wanna show you, this is me, and I'm in the woods, 
This was, um, I don't know. I think I did this one over the summer. And I'm going to sample in this video a body of water. Now, in this particular location, there's no pond, there's no stream, there's no lake, but there is an old tire. And very commonly, a bunch of tractor tires, uh, very commonly when you find a tire that is outside in the woods or outside somewhere, you will notice that the tire well fills with water. And when that fills with water, it's stagnant water, that is the perfect place for a mosquito. Would you call that high quality water? Is that a quality ecosystem? So if I sample this, what am I going to find in there? Am I going to find dragonfly larva? Take a little scoop. Okay, so I'm just grabbing a scoop of water and I'm going to put that water in an ice cube tray because it's easy to observe what's in there when you kind of divide the water up into ice cube trays. And let's see what's in there. Oh, do you see that little thing swimming around? I can see it already. Okay. Now, hopefully... We zoom in a little bit, and there it is. Right here, you'll see a mosquito swimming around, okay? So the point is, that is a body of water we sampled, and based on what organisms we found, we can make a judgment about that body of water. We are finding, I'm finding no organisms that are um, that breathe dissolved oxygen. And so that tells me something about that organism. So that's just a quick um, preview for next week. And uh, I just wanted to kind of throw that at you. And I, I feel like we had introduced that, but we sort of